systems. Now, a system is really a very simple construct. It's all uh, in the background material. It is a very simple construct because it is a means of classifying the components of the system so that you can talk about it, so that you can do analysis and arrive at findings which you run with the office of the minister who then announces something. So it is not a major challenge, it's a classification issue. And a system is made up of actors. And the actors that we normally think about were listed by Indira, government, education, especially higher education, health and research institutions, business, enterprise, foreign institutions, and you can add others, private nonprofits, NGOs, associations, and we've got just about every element of the innovation system sitting in this. I am going to look at a summary of topics, and I have broken them down uh, somewhat arbitrarily by looking at flow issues, flow of anything, uh, government issues, uh, and implicit in that, I suppose, is governments, higher education, because we're interested in higher education, investment and sectoral activities, because we keep mentioning the ICT sector, the need for broadband, Wi-Fi, uh, the corner of the island, whatever island you're sitting on, which is an interesting concept, because some people get, come here to get away from Wi-Fi, knowledge in its various forms, and barriers to whatever you're trying to do. So, uh, I don't know whether that, uh, I suppose it can be seen if you've got excellent vision. Uh, I should have blown it up a bit more. But the flow issues that you put on the table were uh, to help the private sector to uh, access information. And this is something that Obama is rather keen on, getting public databases out and available uh, to the private sector. And you can use that information both as information, which allows you to do things, uh, or you can package it differently, add some additional information, and start selling the stuff. So there are uh, different approaches to providing access to information, which give rise to different entrepreneurial initiatives. To help the private sector to access finance, that is the whole venture capital thing uh, which works in some countries and doesn't in others. Banks uh, being able to interview somebody from a service firm who has got no tangible assets, but they've got brilliant ideas uh, how they get the money to employ the people by the information technology equipment and to support uh, their producing of service that they plan and to make money. Business enterprise, higher education, linkage, another flow in both directions because when higher education helps business enterprise, ideally they learn something and it flows back. Building absorptive capacity, so that flow issue, uh, think of uh, these plants that eat flies, um, the knowledge is out there flying around, you have to be able to capture that knowledge just as the plant captures the fly and digest it and then use the knowledge to do new things. We have a general point which I couldn't find anywhere else to put, so I put it there, uh, the importance of ethics because something that you will find, and of course there are indicators on the subject of varying countries, um, if it is difficult to do business in your country because of uh, corruption, violence, um, other uh, problems, or simply ethical difficulties in contract law, multinationals will go somewhere else. So that is
something that matters as far as innovation is concerned. Government issues, and these are all your issues, by the way, not mine. Uh, the importance of cooperation between ministries, and we had examples, but if you are going to do high-level innovation policy, it has to be high-level, like at the level of the Prime Minister's office. And if it is at that level, the Prime Minister has to be able to command the, the cooperation of the ministers. And if it's not at that level, and it doesn't have that power, forget it. You set up a council, uh, a committee, which will be for several years, consume a lot of resources, generate a lot of air miles, and then expire. And that's not what you want. Um, business enterprise student internships you, you propose as a way of dropping students into the real world, frightening them it may be, uh, so that they can learn something about how to function. Uh, we did have uh, one suggestion that we must improve the country's ranking in international comparisons. A lot of those international comparisons are highly dubious if you look at them. Uh, so we provided the alternative of challenging the ranking. Uh, government policy, industry policy linked to higher education policy. It's very, although it happens in most countries in the world, higher education policy should not be done in isolation because there is a reason why you are doing higher education, which may have something to do with competitiveness and innovation. Uh, more use of public-private partnerships. You keep seeing PPP written on slides. In some cases, uh, it is public partner partnerships as it is here. Purchasing power parity is the other case. Uh, delete that from memory because we don't want to go into that. Within higher education, uh, we turned up barriers back two barriers, the present culture of learning and using knowledge. And the suggestion at the time was too much rote learning, not enough problem solving, which allows you to uh, look at the inputs to a problem and solve them and use knowledge. Critical thinking and the current apparent lack of lifelong learning, although you're all here learning sit there, so I have evidence to the contrary. Uh, human resource capacity, building human resource capacity, uh, before they all go to the United States or Canada or wherever they go, it would be good if the people having gone through the education system, having done the internships, were able to contribute to business enterprise, to have creative ideas, and to uh, improve competitiveness. When they make enough money doing that sort of thing, they might not go somewhere else. So there's a reason for this. Investment in sectoral issues, infrastructure. If the port doesn't exist, the uh, liner cannot dock. Um, if the road doesn't exist, the passengers cannot be offloaded and shipped off to the hotels. And we also need the hotels to exist. So physical access to tourist sites, ah, universal Wi-Fi broadband so they can torment themselves while sitting in their um, tourist accommodation. Um, and also a, a knowledge issue, the creative and cultural industries, the intellectual property. I don't think we have on this slide the indigenous knowledge, but I should turn up on another slide. But your creative and cultural industries here are extremely important and could be capitalized upon. More knowledge. Brain drain. We talked about brain drain. That's an outward flow. The knowledge stock. Traditional knowledge and local knowledge. And traditional knowledge and local knowledge, I should point out, turns up everywhere. So if I walk into a bar in baden württemberg and I ask a question about how I get a job uh, in that particular 
land, uh, I will be told that it helps if you've done a Zealand's apprentice uh, ship and you've uh, gone through a couple of technical uh, examination. So now we will uh, move on to public support for innovation. And really, there are two kinds out there. Uh, support for the actual innovation activities, and we've already rehearsed the innovation activities, and we have here a small subset of innovation activities, research and development, human resource development, capital investment. So you can look at the activities of innovation and decide that people are not, firms are not, investing enough in information communication technologies, and that is a way to get on the various platforms and to produce products and make money. So you provide a tax incentive to invest in ICTs. And you can find examples of that around the world. An alternative or uh, a, a simultaneous approach is to adjust the framework conditions which enable uh, the activity of innovation may also influence the innovation activities and note that those phrases are not the same. But let me add one little footnote in which there is a caveat. Uh, when you play with framework conditions, uh, you are not driven by the philosophy of one of the political parties in the United States that any restriction on free enterprise is evil and we should deregulate across, uh, right across uh, all economic activities. We have seen um, an example of innovation in the United States which has had quite an influence upon our lives. This was an innovation in financial services the bringing of a new or significantly improved product to market, monetized debt based on the housing industry, mortgages, uh, which was permitted by the existing financial services regulation because they had been severely weakened over the years. So this toxic product was put on the market and immediately diffused across the planet. And then, of course, it's self-destructive. And that placed us in the deepest recession uh, since the 1930s, out of which we are still digging. And this killed people in Africa. So these things are not trivial. And the framework conditions are there in order to facilitate innovation and to save us uh, from what we have just been through. Think of a meat packing plant. There are regulations about meat. There are government inspectors that wander around uh, measuring for various evil things that like to live in meat and which will be evil. There we know how to do it. In financial services, we are still learning. So that's the full thing. I'm going to give you some examples from Canadian uh, policy, uh, which focuses on adjusting the framework conditions. Now, why is this? There was a change of government in 2006. The previous government, Liberal, was slightly left of center and was all for supporting just about anything. They were quite enthusiastic about spending public money. And in those days, there was public money. Well, times have changed. The conservatives, slightly right of center, take the view that they're there to uh, make it possible for the private sector to do its thing, which is to make money, pay taxes, and uh, contribute to the welfare of the nation. So that is what they looked at. And if you are really serious about comparing and contrasting innovation strategies, I can take you back to the 2002 um, strategy in Canada, which is totally different, but it's not cited here. So mobilizing science and technology to Canada's advantage, Google it, you can download it, read it at your leisure. 
Mainly, it changed the rules of the game, the framework conditions, or the institutions. Remember those three terms in my first lecture. And it established the Science, Technology, and Innovation Council, STIC. Uh, now, I mention STIC uh, because we are talking here about councils that deal with innovation and science. But remember from my lecture the observation that if you are going to do this seriously, what you need at the top is a very credible innovation council, because it's completely different from science and technology, higher education, and all those things. If you're going to do innovation, do innovation. Otherwise, the higher education sector will capture the money. I've seen that happen in more than one country. Stick then, though I'm now telling you about a council which more or less works, depending upon what day it is, advises the Minister of uh, Industry, and it is internal to government, and the proceedings are confidential. So what advice Stick gives to the Minister, the people never know. And therefore, the failures cannot be seen. Uh, and the successes are claimed by the minister. That's the way politics work. Uh, it runs panels of experts, so it brings in all people when it um, convenes a panel where they don't have the expertise in stick itself. I have an example of an odd person if you are doing uh, studies in user innovation, consumers as user innovators, so I've done it. And as I suggested, if a panel is going to be serious, it has to include the business sector, the higher education sector, and government. So uh, that isn't just the panel, but STIC is a well-balanced uh, advisory panel uh, or council, uh, including all of those people. Now, it does another thing, as well as being totally secretive and evasive, uh, while doing its job, it publishes the State of the Nation report, and there are three. It provides a means of monitoring uh, also, and I'm now going back to the Science and Technology Policy 2007. Uh, not only does STIC, which was created out of the 2007 policy, uh, do its internal thing, but the state of the nation is really reporting on the progress of the government policy. And in addition, the government itself uh, published um, a progress report in 2009, and we're waiting for another one. So that evaluation and reporting is an ongoing thing built in uh, to a high-level uh, policy activity with a high-level council is worth thinking about. A second initiative concerning public support for innovation, what I'm supposed to be talking about, is the so-called Jenkins panel. And it reviewed federal R&D programs and made some recommendations. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story about the Jenkins panel and the power or danger of statistics. The OECD, where I also work, but I don't admit it, uh, <laughs> publishes uh, the Science, Technology, and Innovation Outlook, and also the scoreboard, and these come out every second year. And in these publications was what is known in the OECD as the killer graphic. And the killer graphic presented uh, the direct and indirect support for research and development in the 34 OECD countries. And you get a, it's a bar graph and it's high at one end and low at the other end. And when you look like those bar graphs, and when you look at it, on one side where you're looking at direct support, there is an enormous spike. You 
move across the graph and we get to indirect support, there is another enormous spike. On the left, it is the United States, which principally deals in direct support to R&D. So you get your grant, and it is satisfying some need of government. Government knows what it needs. There's a direct relationship, and they manage it. At the other end, the big spike, is Canada doing indirect support through tax benefit to industry. And the tax benefit to industry means the government itself doesn't ask, uh, so long as the firm can say that it is doing research and development as defined in the Proscotti Manual, which is part of the Canadian Income Tax Act, I should point out. So be careful when you write OECD manuals. Um, that anybody can apply for the tax credit. Great stuff. Now, if you remember my statement about R&D being highly concentrated, in industries, so if you think putting a tax credit out there is opening it up to everybody, it is true, but where the money goes is to the five leading industries that do all the R&D. And so there it is, and you can't control it. That's the whole idea of indirect uh, support. So the government looked at this and thought, there's quite a difference here. Uh, we are appalled that we are so far out on this particular limb while sawing it off at the same time. And uh, perhaps we should do something different. They convened what is called the Jenkins panel, for which I also worked, but I was admitted outside this room. Um, it reviewed federal R&D programs and made recommendations to move from indirect to uh, more direct support of R&D. So that is uh, both an example of how support for uh, by the public sector for innovation uh, exists and can change in response to measurement. So your measurement uh, in the region is not particularly elaborate, but if you make it more elaborate, you could be getting yourselves into real trouble. Good statistics influence judgment. And not always the way in which you think it should. Well, that is rather fun. Now they had a subgroup uh, which looked at procurement. And every country in this room buys things. The government buys goods and services for public activity. And you can influence um, what is being bought and how it is being bought through your procurement policy and you can make that an instrument for public support for innovation. So download Innovation Canada a call to action, for some reason not all in italics, the URL is there, and read it. Uh, the Jenkins panel itself can be found there. Good. Another example, and I'm almost out of time, is uh, the vouchers. I tried to stay away from R&D because here we don't do a lot of R&D. We know that more firms innovate than do R&D. So you can still create value uh, by doing other things, finding new and better ways to put product on the market without necessarily creating knowledge formally. The province of Alberta runs a voucher program, and there is a URL uh, that you can look up, learn more about it, and then take it to your policy makers if you think it's a good thing. And what a voucher does is allow a small firm, and not necessarily, all, not necessarily always small firms, the opportunity of applying for a voucher, which allows them to walk over to the local college, which does practical things, or to the university, which also does practical things, but may have a more uh, a broader awareness of what's going on in the world, and 
and say, look, I've got $50,000 and I've got a problem. And I would like to sit down with you and see how you are going to help me solve my problem. Now we're talking problem solving here, not the doing of research and development. And if the firm gets its problem solved, it can then put new product on the market, make money, and everybody lives happily ever after. So the voucher doesn't, can, applies in areas where R&D is not done. It can also apply in areas where R&D is done.